interesting. Isn't it? It's a bicycle, Rick. Due to the color, I'm assuming it's probably some sort of military bicycle. Do you know anything about it? I just know it's from World War II. I came to the pawn shop today to sell my great-grandfather's bike from World War II. The bike's been sitting in my garage since I was little, and my mom said I can sell it and put it to my college education. I'm not really sure how much it's worth, but I'm hoping I can get a 1000 for it. That is really neat. During World War II, the soldiers over in Europe were shipping everything from bicycles to guns to silverware to artwork, all these things that were considered war prizes back to the United States. And for some reason, your great-grandpa brought a bike back. Yep. The sprocket's really cool where it says BSA. Birmingham Small Arms they made rifles, handguns. Yeah. It looks like it folds up. It does. I don't know if that's for shipping or something like that. Do you mind if I take a closer look at it? Not at all. Sweet. Don't break it, Rick. I'm not going to break it. Yeah, see, it folds up mm -hmm. for easy transportation. It's pretty cool. What is this, like a little horn? Uh, no, that's a, an acetylene lamp on the front of it. Acetylene lamp? Yes. Why wouldn't they just put a flashlight on that? They had flashlights and all that, but the batteries wore out really, really quick. And that was super reliable. Pour some water in there, it creates a settling gas, you light it, and it lights up. Sort of like a blowtorch. Mm -hmm. This folding bike is really cool. I don't know exactly what it was used for, but there's usually a collector's market for just about anything World War II military. So I guess there's got to be some money to be made here. It's a pretty neat bicycle. Looks all complete. Um, how much are you looking to get out of it? I'm hoping I can get a thousand for it. <sighs> Would you take three hundred bucks for it? How about five hundred? <sighs> Don't be a cheapskate, Rick. This thing is obviously dope. That it is. I'm really intrigued by it. I mean, like regular bicycles in this shape from World War II aren't worth a whole lot of money, but it does look military-ish. This thing could have rode down to Hitler's bunker, Rick. You don't want to pass on this bike. I doubt if they attacked it with bicycles. You never know. You weren't there. <sighs> you know what? Yeah, I'll do the 500 bucks. Good. Thank you. OK. Uh, go right her up, chum. All right. Come on with me. I'll write you up. This bike has been sitting in my garage since I was little, and I got $500 for it, and I'm happy. Wow. Yeah, it's a BSA airborne bicycle. So, airborne bicycle. Yeah, it's it was, a flying bicycle. <laughs> yeah, actually, it kind of is. It was designed for British and Canadian paratroopers in World War II. They made about 50,000 of them from 1942 to 1945. This is a folding bike that the paratroopers could hold in the, on front of their chest, jump out of planes with. When they landed, they'd unfold it, put it together, and ride around on them. OK. So there's three battles that they were absolutely used in. On D-Day in the second wave, they used them on an airdrop into Norway, and they used them in Italy in 1943. Now, the question is, why would you ride around on a bike in a combat zone? They weren't really designed to ride in the battle, you know, holding your gun. The British felt that a normal paratrooper unit could get about 20 miles in a day, maybe 25. On a bike, they could get up to 60, maybe even 75. So they thought that these would really be the difference for the invasion of Europe. What I'm amazed about, Rick, is everything on this looks period. I don't see any replacement parts, which is crazy. The seat's definitely BSA World War II. Uh, you can see it's embossed. It's got the original tool pouch. So they actually brought, oh, wow, you actually have them. So these multi-tools can basically take this whole bike apart. Amazingly, these are the original World War II issue rubber tires. You can tell because they have WD, which means War Department. Uh, I mean, they're still holding air. It's unbelievable. OK, cool. So what are they worth? Usually, they're worth about $1,500, $2,000. But this is the only one I've ever seen that's completely original soup to nuts. I wouldn't be surprised if you got 5000 for this. OK. What'd you I'm, pay? I gave her 500 bucks for it. <laughs> so, I mean, I just had no idea. It's a happy accident, then. Some collector or museum out there is going to love this. All right, cool. It's a good find, man. 
Usually when I see these bikes, they are a hodgepodge of original parts and replacement parts. This bike, it's like World War II happened and somebody put it in their attic and forgot about it. Rick purchased it for a steal, so he's got good gut instinct. I have a World War II leather jacket worn by a real war hero, numerous times shot down. Fighter pilots, they did not really have a long life expectancy. Mm -hmm. His plane took 198 bullets, six cannon shots. Yeah, it's it like uh... a miracle to survive. I came down to the pawn shop today to try to sell my World War II fighter jacket. I got the jacket from an old roommate. I have a lot of bills to pay. I'm hoping to get 10,000 bucks. I'd probably take as low as 4,000. So what do you know about the pilot who wore this? It was worn by Henry S. Heidekoper. When I researched it online, found out who the guy was. I said, wow, this guy was a hero. He was captain of the Hellhawks. Seriously? Mm-hmm. The Hellhawks were famous for stopping the Nazis at Normandy. Yeah, they helped soften up the beaches. These guys had to fly low. This was the plane that went over and took out tanks. Right. It really wasn't that fast, but they put a bomber engine in a fighter plane and then put eight 50 caliber machine guns in it. <laughs> and um, these guys would come across with their eight machine guns going and just tear the ground up. Right. The Hellhawks were famous for basically being a bunch of badasses. They were at D-Day, the Battle of the Bulge, and they spearheaded the invasion of Germany. All right, so what do you want to do with it? I'd like to sell it. I feel it's worth 10,000 bucks. This is a genuine military jacket. I can see that. That's easy to tell. On the back collar, actually, is US Navy. I'm pretty sure the Hellhawks were US Army Air Corps. That could very easily be an Army unit and they just acquired some Navy jackets. It's just a little weird to me. I know a guy who will know everything about this jacket. Let me have him look at this thing. Sure. And he will tell me everything about it. Sounds great. If this genuinely belonged to a Hellhawks pilot, it could be worth a lot of money. But I'm almost certain it should be from the US Army, not the US Navy. So I have to get this cleared up. There was a group called the Hellhawks that fought at Normandy. You know, they were very active in the invasion and D-Day and all of that. These guys were very successful fighters. The Hellhawks were quite involved taking out any of the German planes that got up into the air, trying to take out any of the German guns that they could, a significant part of the D-Day invasion. Yeah. It's got the shearling collar on it. This type of weaving here is World War II with the two different types of weaving here. The patch is a World War II style of patch. Jacket itself, in terms of being World War II, everything's correct on that. In terms of Heide Cooper himself, he was in the Hellhawks. I did find him listed in the Hellhawks as a member of the unit. The problem is he was not the member of the Hellhawks that fought at Normandy. The Hellhawks is just the nickname for a group. Really? Yeah, it isn't the official name. So you also had a Marine Corps group that was VMF 213 that were the Hellhawks also in World War II. And Heide Cooper is somebody that was in VMF 213. And they were a naval air group but it is a, a very nice World War II fighter jacket, less common than the Army fighter jackets. Thanks a lot, man. You're the best. Not a problem. Hey, Hope this Mark, helps. Appreciate the info. The squadrons get known by the nicknames, but that's not their official name. So you get some confusion when you get an overlap of the same name and two different units. Now, um, you will not get $10,000 for it. But we do have a World War II fighter jacket that I'd be willing to pay like $1,500 for. Yeah, I, I agree with you now that I know more. 10 grand is high, but uh, it's got so much history. I'd take 4,000 bucks for it. It's very interesting. The price doesn't go as much as they were a few years ago. I'll give you 2,000 cash right now. 2,500? No. No. I'd go 2,000, not a penny more. Let's make a deal. OK. All right, meet you right up there. We'll All right. write it up. Thank you.
I gotta be honest, I was a little bummed when Mark told me it was from a different Hellhawks. But it's still a cool jacket, and I think collectors will definitely be lining up for something like this. I have some battle plans and after action reports from the Normandy invasion. I'm coming down to the pawn shop today to try and sell my collection of battle plans from the invasion of Normandy. They are reports that were gathered through each of the divisions and put into one document. I'm hoping to get five to $6,000 for this, um, but about the minimum I would take would be 2,500. I got these from my grandfather. He was in uh, World War II with 82nd Airborne. He worked in the plans office. It contains maps with uh, drop zones and defensive positions. D-Day is one of the most historic days in our nation's military history. Nazi Germany had a good hold over almost all of Europe, and the Allies needed a way in, and France was it. 160,000 men stormed the beach of Normandy, but man, was it costly. Thousands died. Operation Neptune. Summary of enemy situation. I mean, it's really, really unique. I mean, it really tells a story about what went on that day, which uh, a lot of people would really be interested in. I'm just trying to figure out when these were printed. It's going to be much cooler if we have actual pre-battle plans as opposed to a synopsis of what happened afterwards. OK. All right. The invasion was June 6th. This is 28 May. This is things they want the troops to do when they, when they land. So this would actually be part of the plans to attack. So what did you want to do with it? I'd like to think about selling it. It's been really hard for me to find any comparable material to this to really value it. Rick, I want somebody to look at this. OK, yeah. Um, thing is, we have two different things here. We have this bound boulder right here, All right. which is after the battle took place. This right here appears to be pre-battle. And I would like to know exactly what these maps are. OK. So let me get a buddy of mine down here and find out exactly everything we got here. OK. And then um, we'll go from there, all right? All right. Rick and the guys normally call me down when they have something military, historic. You know, I don't speak to the value of it, but I can give them some understanding of what its value is uh, historically. So, Rick, what's what are your concerns on these? This has a lot of maps and things like that in it, and I'm wondering if that is pre-battle or post-battle. This is post-battle. You can tell that just from the cover. You're not going to know at the beginning of the battle what the end date is. Yeah. These maps would take you all the way through the battle, where people landed, what they did, where they went, find out what went right, what went wrong. When you want to know exactly what happened at the time, this would be the primary historical document to okay. start from. But you said you also have pre-battle? I'm assuming they are. OK. This is nice. This is where they were supposed to be, where they were supposed to come together. And what do we have here? Top secret. Oh, this is great. These are pre-battle. This is where you're going to be landing, who is going to be where, which division is going to be where. You know, these are all the places that they are supposed to land. This is how it was supposed to work. You will take San Mary Glaze. You will seize and destroy crossings on the Douve River. This is amazing. The documents from before the battle are much scarcer because these were the documents that if they got into German hands before the battle actually happened, they would know exactly what we were planning on doing. These kinds of documents are going to be in places like the National Archives because it's top secret. You weren't supposed to bring this stuff home. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, they're archival pieces rather than display pieces. These are quick production pieces from World War II. This just doesn't hold up. It is not color fast. If you get any light on it, these are the sorts of things. You put this in a frame and put it up on the wall, it's gone. These you'd need to just put away. They need to be in a dark, acid-free container and kept in a stable environment. All right, you're the best. I got all the <laughs> info, man. Thank you. All right, when I first saw these things, I was thinking big dollars because we have top secret battle plans for the invasion of Normandy. Now that I find out that I can't frame them and hang them on a wall, that's going to be a major problem. I mean, they're important pieces of history, and they should be treated as such. Unfortunately for me, I can't take them if I can't sell them. I mean, I'm a business here. I, you know, I'm not a museum. OK, absolutely. Thanks for bringing them in. All right. Hey, thank you very thank much, you. sir.
There's no question these are great pieces of history, but I kind of dodged a bullet. In half a year, I would have had really expensive blank pieces of paper hanging on my wall. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. What do we have here? It's a World War II bomb site. This thing is really cool. Are you sure it's not like a James Bond nuclear bomb or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who collects World War II stuff is going to love this. So how much you want for this thing? Um, I really don't know, based on what you've shared with me, as much as possible. <laughs> OK, let me call a guy up. He's the curator of an aviation museum, so he'll know more about it. I'll be right back. All right, thank you. I really hope I don't get embarrassed in this thing as a microwave oven. You think you've got a real Norden bomb side this time? I think so. There's no identifying anything on it. Yes, well, it's part of a Norden bomb site. What you've got is the site head. What you're missing is the stabilizer and the autopilot, the rest of the Norden bomb site. But you have the iconic part, the I part have the head that, of the statue. <laughs> that's right. It, this is the part that people know. It probably was on a naval plane. With the kind of wear that's on it, probably a Mark 15. It's something that anybody who is into iconic pieces from World War II, they're going to be very interested in this. Cool. Thanks, man. I appreciate Not it. No problem. Very cool. All right, I'll tell you what. I'll give you 800 bucks for it. Top secret, historical significance, head of the statue, great mantelpiece okay, for yeah, World yeah, War II buffs. It's not all there. We have pieces missing. And it's obviously not that secret. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a thousand bucks. I think it's a fair price. You got it for nothing, and I gotta find someone to buy it. All good points, fair enough. Thousand bucks is more than I had when I came in. I'll take it. Thank you. Sweet. I'll meet you right around the corner. We'll do some paperwork. Thank you. It's not a pizza maker, but I'm going to make a lot of dough on this, hopefully. <laughs> you like it so much, it's not downstairs, it's in your office? Well, I'm thinking about, like, you know, I got my bolt. I got my <laughs> Norton Bob site. <laughs> so what do you think? I mean, they're incredibly rare. They're very difficult to find because most of them were decommissioned after the war. You're lucky to get it. So developed for World War II, used in most of the major bomber aircraft, so the B-17 by Boeing, the B-24 by Douglas. The B-17 had a crew of 10 men, and now there was a pilot, a co-pilot, there was a navigator, and there was specifically a bombardier. You, as the bombardier, have to decide when to let the bombs go. Before this, they used to have to do charts, and it would take them so long to figure it out that they were already missing their targets. Because of this site, the accuracy improved dramatically for the bombers. This allowed them to get within about a 30-meter circle of where they were trying to hit from 20,000 feet. And that's why they were so advanced that they wound up using them all the way to the beginning stages of Vietnam. They're dropping thousands and thousands of tons of bombs based on one of these sites. That's crazy. I didn't know exactly what one of these things looked like, so I had Mark Patton look at it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he says, yeah, this is a Norton bomb site, at least the major part of one. Yes. Well, I, there are, there's like, there's an eye cup that goes here. You can see this part, the post is gone. But for the most part, from the ones that I've seen, it is pretty much complete. This plugs in to allow it to have light. And then these lever or dials over here adjust and calibrate this site. And you're actually looking down through the plane down at the ground. Dials help you understand your airspeed and your direction. And from that, based on charts that you have, which this, this whole part here slides out. And they would have done that, and they would have kept different maps, charts. You do have a data plate here, US Navy. Yeah, so this is a Mark 16. It's the M series. This is the standard bomb site. The U US Army Air Force used them, and the US Navy used them. OK. So what do you think it's worth? Well. One in this condition, which is, I would say, on a scale of one to 10, it's sort of, it's a seven. Uh, you know, there's a few minor missing parts, but it's mostly clean and mostly together. It's nice that you have the data plate that really helps it. And this appeals to military collectors, but also instrument collectors, because this is the end of an era. It was the height of what you could do with instrumentation. So I think in this condition, it's at least $2,500.
Okay, cool, because I paid a grand for it. You did? Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Oh, yeah. All right, man, I, I got some other stuff to show you. Come on. Oh, that's really cool. I might actually keep that, though. It looks good on your desk. Hello, how can I help you today? Hi, I found this awesome jacket at a thrift store. I loved the style and all the patches. I knew it meant something to somebody. This is definitely cool. We even got some dice right here, perfect for Las Vegas. <laughs> there we go, yeah. <laughs> How much are you looking to get for it? I was thinking about 350. Um, that's not out of the question, but I think a lot of the value here is going to be in these patches because there's tons of patches, especially from this period, World War II area, that patches are worth, you know, $100 or several hundred dollars. You know, I'm really going to have to have someone come and take a look at this because there's maybe 100 patches on it. Yeah, yeah. If you have a few minutes, I'll make a phone call. I do. Uh, get my guy down here, and he's a real nerd for military stuff. Okay. He'll probably know all about these uh, patches and about this jacket. <laughs> That's what we need. <laughs> Give me a few minutes, all right? Okay, thank you. I would love for an expert to come in and look at this jacket because I'd like to know a little bit more information about it and some details about some of these really cool patches. Wow. Pretty freaking cool, huh? I'm pretty sure it's World War II. I mean, you could probably tell me better. Absolutely, yes. This is a model 1943 field jacket. Standard issue infantry jacket. Um, the jacket itself is very common, but military patches, especially from World War II, uh, some of them are highly collectible. Now, the thing that makes a patch good, it's the rarity of the patch, or like a famous division. If a division or a regiment did something really well known, I mean, I can already tell you in here, this is 82nd Airborne. They jumped into Normandy on D-Day. This is 101st Airborne. If you ever saw Band of Brothers, yeah, that's all yes. 101st Airborne guys. But I thought the photographer patch was pretty cool. Yeah, that's interesting. I will say this, I don't know whose jacket this was, but if I had to guess, being a photographer would make sense because if you were in World War II, you would be in a specific infantry division. You wouldn't get the chance to meet all these people. Um, a photographer might be. I think it was somebody's collection of their time during the war. Let me take a look at some of these other patches. Oh. So the more I look at this, the more excited I am by it. I mean, um, well, I'll do the big one. This was known as a blood chit. So this is a Pacific um, issued patch, and it was typically used by American pilots and airmen. And they would sew it on the back of the leather jackets or on the inside. And if they went down, this would basically translate to something like, I'm an American soldier, please help me and you'll be rewarded. And so that patch is extremely rare. This is an $800 patch. $800? Yeah, we're getting closer to that 350 yeah. you wanted. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of value do you think this thing has all together? I've been doing this for almost two decades. I've never seen anything like this. It truly is one of a kind. 6,500? Wow, yes, thank you. <laughs> Wish I gave it a 350. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I'm sure you like what he had to say. more than $350. <laughs> With that being said, it's really cool. I could give you 2500 That's a lot more than you were asking. And maybe 4000 You know, I wish I could, but I have to be able to sell it. I mean, at $2,500, I'm in it at a fair amount. Did you go up about $500 more? $3,000? Just a little bit more? I'll do $3,000. $3,000? Let's go Thank write you. it up. Thank All you. Right. Leave it right here. Come on. OK, thank you. I'm getting married soon, and I was hoping that $350 would at least help with the cake. And then now getting $3,000 is going to pay for a cake and hopefully a photographer, too. Today I'm looking at a completely original 1944 Willys Army Jeep. How's it going? It's going well, man. How are you? I'm Rick. TC, nice to meet you. So this is the Willys Jeep? Yeah, this is the 1944 Willys Jeep. It's been pretty much fully restored. It's in great shape. Runs awesome. They made them so they're really simple, really reliable. They're four-wheel drive, so they'd basically go anywhere. And they tried to make them GI-proof, but I don't think anything's actually GI-proof. <laughs> <laughs> I called Rick to come take a look at my 1944 Willys Jeep. I'm selling the Jeep now because I just bought a house, and I'm starting a family, and I really just don't have any room for it. 
This is incredible. Originally, there wasn't a company called Jeep. The whole Jeep name sort of happened, and there's a few different theories on it. The one theory I like the best is Popeye actually had this invisible magic dog <laughs> in some of his episodes, and its name was Jeep. Oh, wow. And the thing was, like, indestructible. It could do, like, anything. And then the other theory is it was the general purpose vehicle, the GP. OK. Sort of translates into Jeep. That makes sense. They were incredible vehicles for their time. Where did you get this thing? I actually got it off a buddy of mine who was a Marine. He fully restored it. It's got all the uh, original parts. I'm pretty impressed, actually. I mean, it's in really good shape. Because usually these things were so bastardized, it was unbelievable. So many guys bought surplus Jeeps from World War II, and then they tried to customize them, and then a lot of them just tried to keep running with you know, bubble gum and duct tape. Right. So it's rare you find them that are completely original like this. Yeah, it's pretty stock. So how much are you looking to get out of it? Well, I was thinking 25. Does the gun come with it? Uh, sure. Why not? <laughs> OK. I have a buddy that's like an hour from here, and he would know a lot more about this than me. Do you mind if I get him down here to take a look at it? Sure. All right. I'm actually glad that there's an expert coming to look at this Jeep, because I know it's in very good condition, and I think Rick's going to buy it. Wow. This thing is gorgeous. What year is it? 1944. All right. So in July 1940, the US Army sees that they're probably going to get pulled into World War II. They realized they needed a sort of all-purpose utility vehicle that was four-wheel drive. Willys was actually granted the first contract. The cool thing is, Willys goes on to start making the CJ series, the civilian Jeep series. And really, the Jeeps that are made today are very recognizable, having this been their sort of grandfather. And the design really hasn't changed all that much. So. The thing I need to do is basically establish how original this is. The more original parts, the more valuable it is. OK. The biggest thing I look for on a Willys is right here is a data plate. The serial number is consistent with 1944. So no question that the body or the tub and the frame are original 1944. That is great. The next thing we need to do is check the engine. Can you help me pop this? Sure. Well, I don't have to look that hard. That is a post-war engine. A CJ engine from the 1940s, which is very popular to do with these Jeeps. They're a little bit more reliable, but for a collector purist, they want a World War II engine. OK. It's still a gorgeous Jeep. And I think, actually, the last thing we need to do is. You guys want to take it for a spin? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I've even got some yeah. helmets for you. I'm good. Safety first, Rick. I don't consider that a safe helmet. <laughs> there we go. All right. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a Cadillac. <laughs> yeah. This is so awesome. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. That was cool. <laughs> I got to admit, I'm, I'm deeply impressed. TC, thank you so much. Sure. That was so fun. <laughs> so I'm assuming it runs perfect. It runs perfect. It handled everything it was supposed to handle. So what do you think it's worth? I think you could get 25000 for it, Rick. Thanks, man. You're welcome. I think this is a great buy because it appeals to Jeep collectors and military collectors, so it's a broader base. All right, so uh, what's your best price on it? Well, I was hoping to get twenty-five. dollars You take eighteen? dollars uh, I can't go that low, man. I can come down, but not that far. Uh, twenty-three. How about nineteen grand? I'm going to have expenses. i got to ship this thing back to the West Coast. I don't know if I can go that low. Ah. I don't, 22. I'll make it plain and simple. I'll give you 20 grand. It's more than a fair price. Uh, all right, 20. Sweet. Let's go do some paperwork, <laughs> and right. uh, I get this thing shipped in Vegas. Cool. I decided to take the 20000 because I really just need this Jeep gone. I'm going to take the money and put an addition on the back of my house. So I'm in the middle of the desert in search of a tank for the shop's lot. Apparently, there's an authentic Sherman tank for sale that was used, get this, in Iwo Jima during World War II. It doesn't get much better than that. It's going to be an explosive day. So are we close? Almost there. About five more minutes out. That's it right there. And that's the Sherman. Wow. All right, we're here. Look at that tank. Holy 
That is amazing. The tank the guys are looking at right now is an M4A3 Sherman. What makes this tank special, it's the only Sherman tank in private hands that was actually used in the Pacific Theater and real Marines jumped into during Iwo Jima. And now they can relive that history as well. This is incredible. So this thing actually saw action in Iwo Jima. This one did. It did see action. It was knocked out three times in the first 24 hours. Um, it was finally taken out of service when they hit the turret at the turret bearing. And uh, we met the gentleman who had to back it out. He's still alive today. I look at it, I just find it incredible because, I mean, it's from Iwo Jima. I mean, it's like when they raised the flag on Mount Suribashi, I mean, it's probably the most iconic photo of all of World War II. How much you want for this thing? Um, I'm looking to get a million and a half. OK, but we get to drive it? You can drive it and you can shoot it. It's pretty damn cool. Um, you need to go call Corey. Tell him to come down here. He doesn't want, he's not going to want to miss this, OK? All right. Can you, like, point it into a direction so I'm in a straight line? You can do that, too. <laughs> the guy's asking $1.5 million. And that kind of money, I'm thinking about it. But before I do anything, I'm going to have to drive it, and I'm going to have to fire it. OK, here we go. World War II tanks are always going to have an iconic place in a collector's mind. And when thinking about World War II tanks, you think Sherman tank. But the Shermans were reliable, they were quick, they were easy to fix, and they had good firepower. So if you want a World War II tank, you want a Sherman. Here we go. Nice job, Rick. The door of that car was up for like four seconds. Oh, man. This has been the greatest day of my life, by the way. Not when you were born, Corey. No. <laughs> this is much better than that, I'm sure. You did a good job, Pops. Oh, look at that car. What do you think, Alex? I mean, it is what it is. It speaks for itself. Sherman's are the most desired American tank from World War II. It runs well. It fires well. It's got historical provenance from Iwo Jima. There is one that we know of that sold in the last year that wasn't documented to being at any major battle in the World War II, and it was sold for 1.2 million. So at one and a half million, I, I think that's a fair price. OK, let's get out of here. <laughs> I'll meet you at the Humvee. You know, I mean, when me and Alex started discussing me buying a tank, I was thinking I could get into something like this for a couple hundred grand uh, because they made like 50,000 of these, right? A, a little more than that. Yeah, and um, it's amazing. It's got amazing history. Everything about it is absolutely great. But um, it's so out of the ballpark for me, man. <laughs> Thanks, man. Amazing day. This is like one of the greatest days of my life, dude. I drove a tank and I blew something up with a tank. <laughs> oh my God. What do we got? Hey, I have a military payment certificate. It's a $20 one and they were paid to military personnel to keep the American dollar out of enemy's hands. They were produced around 1940 to 1972. So how was Vietnam? <laughs> <laughs> I came down to the pawn shop today to sell a military payment certificate. It was paid to military personnel overseas. My son purchased it at a coin auction. I'm hoping to get 250 out of it for my son to go to a Boy Scout trip this summer.
Military payment certificate for use only in the United States military establishments, $20. They're pretty cool. When the U.S. was fighting overseas, there was a problem with U.S. soldiers trading American dollars on the black market. So to stop U.S. dollars from getting in the hands of enemies, our government actually came up with temp currency. This isn't money. This is a coupon that's redeemable for currency. You're in the Army, you're in Vietnam, and they hand you this instead of real money. Okay. And it, it was an extreme morale killer. Most of these guys are over there in Vietnam. They didn't want to be there. They got drafted into going. They're making just a very small amount of money. And when they go to get paid, they get handed some fake coupon thing that says it's money, but it's not. <laughs> OK. How much are you looking to get? Uh, 250. 250. Okay. Um, I've seen these go as high as $2,500, $3,000. $3, and I'm sure they've gone for more. And I've seen them sell for $4. <laughs> It's all about condition. And all this staining that you see right here, mm -hmm. it really just knocks the value down. I'd go like 100 bucks. Can you do 150? I'll go 125 bucks. That's the most I'm going to pay for it. OK, deal. Deal? All right. Meet me over there. I'll write you up. OK. I feel pretty good. I think my son will enjoy going to Boy Scout camp this summer. Hey, how can I help you? Right, good afternoon. A cavalry sword. Civil uh, War officer sword. Model 1860. Belonged to uh, Colonel Bassett. This is pretty cool. It was pretty cool. <laughs> I'm selling a Model 1860 officer Civil War sword. I found the sword up around Yosemite. The sword is in beat up condition considering it went through 22 battles. I'm selling the sword because my wife wanted a new kitchen and my wife should get what she wants. What's his name again? Bassett. OK. Do you know much about this? Colonel Bassett came into the uh, Civil War as a captain into the 17th Regiment, one of the most highly decorated officers, because he went in as captain. Came out as a brave general, went through 22 skirmishes and battles, and was there at least surrender. There's no other sword that's seen as much battle as this sword has seen. OK. What do you want to do with this? I'm going to sell it. And how much do you want for it? 20 grand. 20 grand. You want to have someone look at this? No, I okay. would actually welcome it. All right, I will be right back. Um, hang out. OK. It is always nice to have an expert look at it. I'm excited to listen to what he has to say. It's uh, history, and that's what excites me, is to uh, relive the history of what these guys went through during the Civil War. The problem is, I don't know if it was used in battle, and I know nothing about this Bassett guy. So I'm bringing in the smartest guy I know because he's always got the answers. This is the sword of the colonel that he says was later a general. OK, this and, is and the Colonel Bassett that you called me yes, about? Yes, that, oh, that is the guy, nice. Colonel Bassett. Um, I've never heard of him. The, the, you know, one of the things about the Civil War is there are, there are so many men involved that a lot of officers sort of drop off the radar. You know, you hear about the real big name ones, and you hear the ones that got some kind of really cool name, Stonewall Jackson or something like that. Isaac Bassett, there, there's no cool name there. I'm curious, what is your concern about it? It, it is obviously a Civil War sword. No, I mean, it, it's got his list of his battles right here. Oh, it's really? got some engraved, okay. it's got his name engraved on it. It would have been extremely unusual for Bassett to have this done. You didn't engrave your own sword. Correct. People would give them to you. Given that this is Colonel Bassett, and it's ending it with Gettysburg, that makes sense. Because he made Colonel in May of 1863. Gettysburg is July of 1863. So this was probably given to him as a presentation piece. Everything fits, everything's right. And this is an absolutely original Civil War presentation sword. And you don't normally find those. I mean, he's saying that it's this was broken off in battle, and I don't think there's any way to prove that. No. Because if this was done from something hitting it, 
you would see some sign of, of bending. It looks to me like it's just a snap. My guess is if something like this had actually been broken in battle, there'd be a record of it. He would have made sure of that. Okay. You gave me all the information I need and more. <laughs> <laughs> I always try. <laughs> You're the best, man. Good to see you. Very good to meet Thank you. you. Thank very you. Much. Unfortunately, the sword is in terrible condition because if it was in good shape, this, you'd have people lining up around the block that would want this. All right, uh, I'll tell you right now, if this thing was in beautiful condition, I'd offer you $10,000 for it because you have a Civil War general sword. But it's just, the break in it just detracts so much. In this shape, I'll offer you $2,500. Well, I'm just going to, I'll have to decline that. OK. I mean, what's your best price? Yeah, we're too far apart. I completely understand. But um, thanks for bringing it in, man. I really appreciate it. I very it. much appreciate you looking at it. OK. The expert brought up two or three facts that I was totally unaware of. I think I'm going to continue coming up with some more research, and then I'll probably put it back up for sale. Hey, how can I help you? Hi. I've got. A 1943 World War II Morse code decipher machine. Wow. You gotta realize most of the World War II coding machines were still illegal to have up to like 10 years ago. Nope. No, literally, you could go to prison for a long, long time for having one. Okay. Even World War II ones. No one here in a black car followed you or anything, did they? Uh, no, I, no, I think I'm good. <laughs> it's the machine that they use deciphering Morse code. I got it from a friend of mine about a year ago, and it's kind of cool, but money's cooler. I'm going to ask 300 bucks for it. I'll take a little less, but not too much. We'll have to see how that goes. It's mega intriguing, OK? The militaries have always used code. Almost all the messages were used through telegraph. And during World War II, they were really difficult to decode. Sometimes we broke them, sometimes we didn't. Code breaking was very, very important during World War II. And if you screwed up in your Morse code just a little bit, people could die. So if it's what he says it is, I would love to have this in my shop. So do you know if it works? It turns on. I haven't run a tape through it, so. There's obviously a lot of vacuum tubes or something to make it this damn heavy. Yes, yeah, it's <laughs> extremely heavy. That's World War II technology right there. Uh, <laughs> it's all here. It's all the original wiring. I like it. So how much you want for it? Well, I was going to ask 300. OK. Um, I want to call somebody up who will tell me what the hell this is. Oh, okay? works for me. He would be impressed, and he will know if you're going to prison or not. So uh, okay. hang out like 15 <laughs> minutes, all right? This is the Super Enigma version of a World War II decoder or a really weird film projector. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you put something Morse code in, and it beeps out the other end. TG-34A, this was one of the most used types of Morse equipment that we had in World War II. I did bring something down here that I think will help you to understand exactly what this is. OK, and that is secret code? <laughs> that is actually the tape that goes into this. How the hell do you have that? I, <laughs> to, to be perfectly honest, this was in my garage. <laughs> so I figured wow. I'd bring it down so that you could see it. OK. Um, OK. Yeah, you were just one weird guy. <laughs> <laughs> but this would actually be on a reel like this, and it would beep either with dits or dots, Dits or dots? Dits or dots. Dits are the short beeps, dots are the long beeps. But most men who went into the service didn't know Morse code. They had to be taught. This is a training machine. Oh, wow. Um, a machine like this was really important because one dit or dot wrong, and you can completely throw off a battle, throw off a plan, tell people to go to the wrong place. So it was very important that you were actually being trained to do it precisely as you were hearing it. So this was not used in the battlefield, obviously. This was no. used in the States in a classroom setting. Yes. 
This is a training unit. Okay. All right, well, thanks, man. I know exactly what I have now. All righty. During World War II, Morse code was the common language that could be used. It's one of those codes that a lot of people know. But in the military, you had to be so exact that you had to go back to school to learn it. You know what? It looks like it's in good shape. I have no idea if I can sell it. I'll give you 200 bucks. I went online and did research it, and they were between five and 900. There's one guy in the world with a really big beard with the only tape for this thing, and even he doesn't want it. 250? 200 bucks, and I am taking a big shot whether I'm ever gonna sell this thing or not. So if you want 200 bucks, I'll give you 200 bucks. All right, 200 bucks. All right, sweet, man. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just leave it here for now, and I'll meet you right up front. All right, thank you. When I found out it was a training tool, I got disappointed. I'm like, there goes the price, because it's not out in the field and all that. But 200's a fair price. That'll uh, give me some spending money here in Vegas, and I can have some fun with that. OK. <laughs> so what exactly you got here? It's a World War II ammunition hand cart. All right, do you know much about it? It's a rusty old car with broken down tires. What else do you need to know? <laughs> Believe it or not, I got it out of a garbage pile. It looks like it belongs in a garbage <laughs> pile. <laughs> so how would this work? Would you, like, hook it up to a horse? I imagine there was a handle right there, but you would hook it up to a Jeep if you needed to, just moving stuff around. The thing's built like a tank. I mean, obviously, it was built so uh, it could be shot. Do you know which company made it or anything like that? There's a placard on it that just tells what area it came from. OK, we got a um, hand cart and Rock Island Arsenal. It's from World War II, I imagine. Basically, every bit of industry was making something for the war. You know, most people don't realize this. During World War II, there was no cars made for personal use. The saying was, stop making what you're making, start making stuff for the war. During World War II, America's policy was basically all hands on deck. Everyone was expected to help with the war effort. And a cart like this was an important piece of equipment. It could haul ammo, food, medical supplies. And in a pinch, you could throw a wounded soldier on it and bring him back from the battlefield. Fully restored, these things can fetch a pretty penny. So how much you want for this thing? I actually had it in a paper for sale. With zero research, I put it in for $500. So obviously, it didn't sell for $500. Uh, no, <laughs> not yet. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, the one great thing you do have is it's all here. I mean, it looks neat. It looks interesting. There's a lot of collectors for stuff from World War II. My problem is I don't even know if it'd be worth fixing up. So what if I call someone? I got a one buddy who knows about this stuff. And if it's not worth restoring, he might buy it off you for parts. All right. All right. So we are fine. Most of them went to Europe during World War II. They were used to carry uh, everything from food to a 50 caliber machine gun. Even mortars were put in these things. This is probably made in the early 40s, and they were pretty useful. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the 1962 movie, The Longest Day, when the Duke got wounded, they put him in here and carried him into battle. <laughs> It is just really cool, and they're friggin' hard to find. Good news for me, I guess, huh? Yeah. <laughs> when I walked in, I knew it was a hand cart from World War II. Everything was carried in them. Uh, I felt sorry for the guys that had to pull them, but these things went all over Europe, and they pulled a lot of things and put a lot of miles on them. So how much is this thing worth the way it sits? Well, these were selling for $1,500 to $2,000 in this condition. Really? Because I thought it was a complete piece of myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a restored condition, you could almost double that, because um, they want it. If it looks like the real thing, they're happy with it. All right, so tell me, how much would it cost to restore it? Probably talking about twelve to $1,400. Honestly, I didn't think it was worth that much either. I'm I still sort of like baffled. I'll tell you what, I'll give you 400 bucks for it. That's not too far off of what I was asking in the paper, so I'll take 400 if you'll take a picture of it when you finish it. Yeah, I'll send you a picture of it when I finish That'd it. That'd be cool, all right. I bought a really cool World War II ammunition cart, and my buddy Bob has been restoring it. There's always hidden cost in restorations, and I hope when it's all said and done, there's some room for some serious profit here. So what do you guys think? 
Well? This thing looks pretty good. It does look cool. It looks straight out of G.I. Joe the movie. <laughs> well, hey, we'll grab our rifles, we'll grab our guns, and we'll join. It doesn't look anything what it looked like. No. Well, it took a lot of work. Actually, this little small thing was so intense to get it done. It was pretty tough. What'd you have to do? Well, um, I ripped the floor out and I actually made new ribs for it. I put all the original holes where they're supposed to be. So that way, if you want to mount a 50 caliber in here, you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it came out pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I was absolutely shocked that it looks like this thing right here, because when I gave it to you, it looked like hell. You gotta realize this thing went through World War II. You know, it was just a tough, tough life this thing had. You were telling me before these sell for like $2,500? I'll be honest with you, I would start at $2,800 and feel where you're comfortable from there. I wouldn't let it go for a dime less. Because the collectors that, that go for these, you know, it's, it's got to be original and with the numbers on there, it pops. So what do the numbers mean? It's the sixth vehicle, headquarters, third division, so it, you should be able to get a good price for it. Big question, how much are you? Well, like I said, I told you 1400 and that's it. Okay, let me go pay you. Let me see what it gets like with a little weight in here. So you can pull 185 pounds? Yeah, but you're more like 240. <laughs> Chum looked like a real soldier pulling Rick around. I'm surprised Rick even got in the cart. Slow down, Chum, slow down. I just got a call from some guy who says he's got some high-tech military vehicle for sale. Sounds like something he should be selling to the Pentagon. But I'm gonna go check it out. Maybe I can get it first. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> what in the world is this? Batman's tank. <laughs> it's a prototype hybrid intended for the military. Awesome. So where exactly did you get it? A company that built military components. They spent over a million dollars building it, and I couldn't pass it up. All right. Well, it is pretty badass, I can tell you that. Is that a gun on top? That's a camera that holds a gun. It held a 50 caliber or an M16. Set up like a fighter pilot. You've got a, a navigator and a gunner. They're all behind bulletproof glass. Obviously, someone did spend a lot of money on it. Military contractors spend millions developing prototypes like this, and if the Pentagon actually orders these things, the payoff could be astronomical. So I can get in? Absolutely. Don't hurt yourself now. Yeah, this is not exactly fat guy friendly. <laughs> well, I don't think they wanted people to get out of it. Actually, it's not too bad. Yeah, see? Especially if you were in military shape. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you driven it? I haven't driven it. They didn't give me the way to start it. You know what? This would be a lot of brain damage trying to figure out how to get going, especially when there's no manual. Right. Come on, Rick. You've got the biggest head at the shop. You could figure it out. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so how much are you looking to get out of it? I'm asking 150. I don't know whether to tell you you're crazy or maybe. <laughs> I'm a little crazy. <laughs> um, there's a lot of doomsdayers and bunker nuts, and uh, you know, somebody is gonna want this. Um, do you mind if I call up somebody? I don't know who you could possibly know that would know anything about it. I know a guy who deals a little bit in military vehicles. He might be able to help me out with this. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. As soon as I figure out a way to get out of here, I'm gonna give him a call. <laughs> I hope the guy knows what he's talking about. There are a lot of expensive components that are not going to be able to be seen just by crawling around the vehicle. This is the apparatus. Nice. <laughs> Will is a former Army Ranger and Air Force pararescue man. And even though I hate to admit it, he knows a lot more about modern military equipment like this than I do. See, I'm actually familiar with this. It's very cool. I mean, obviously, there were some guys that put some real time and effort into engineering into this. Something you could put a, a small team of guys in and move them very quickly on the battlefield, faster than you could in a tank or something like that. I spent 15 years in the military. Special operations is what I do. Some people think you have to be a little crazy to be in special ops. I prefer to think of it as uh, gifted, not crazy. So is this legal to own? Yeah, I know guys that own Hellcat tanks that actually shoot. So, I mean, there's no reason <laughs> why you can't own this. Now, whether or not it's street legal is, is another question. It's got headlights and blinkers and should all work, but right, it should. Should. So how come the military never bought these? With this particular vehicle, I mean, I see a lot of complicated 
mechanical parts and wires running everywhere. It doesn't look like it's gonna hold up to an IED blast. Why would you go with a vehicle like this that tactically uh, just looks unmanageable? Getting your product picked up by the government, it's a hard, hard process to go through. You're gonna spend a lot of money developing it, and if you fail, you just wasted all your time and money. So, can you figure out a price on this thing? The engine alone is probably worth anywhere from seven to $13,000. The body itself, it looks cool, but what are you gonna do with it? I would say maybe $25,000, $30,000 tops. Really? You really think that low, huh? Collectors want vehicles that were actually used by militaries around the world. Because this is a prototype, the fact that it doesn't work could become an issue. I can't see a whole lot of people going after this thing. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. No worries. Thanks a lot. Millions of dollars went into the development of that vehicle, but millions of dollars also went into the development of tourniquets. And a tourniquet costs $35. So you still want 150 grand for it? the high dollar parts that are in this thing. We're still just over 100 grand. We don't know if anything works. Are you interested in it at all? I mean, for like 20 grand, to get this thing running is anywhere between 50 bucks and 500,000. 20 grand on the table, man. 95,000 is kind of what I got to be at. We're just way too far apart. Okay. Okay. If you change your mind, give me a call. All right. I've got a couple other offers. If the next offer is the right offer, then I'll let it go. Chum, what did I tell you about the swords? Not to take your life. Not to play with them. They're not toys. I know. I'm a sensei, master ninja. <laughs> How can I help you? I have a 1873 Winchester. Oh, sweet. It was from the Battle of Wounded Knee. And I got the documents to prove it. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty significant in history. What's the Battle of Wounded Knee? The Battle of Wounded Knee, or the Massacre of Wounded Knee, because that's basically what it was. It was the winter of 1890. In South Dakota, the Lakota Indians were camped out next to a river. The 7th Cavalry was going to disarm them. They went into the camp. One of the Indians did not want to give up his gun. Somewhere, a shot rang out. The 7th Cavalry started shooting like crazy. Basically, what they did is they started just massacring everybody. Um, this was the last, I think, major conflict with American Indians. The Wounded Knee Massacre was a huge screw-up by the U.S. Army. Most of the Native Americans that were killed were not even armed, including women and children. And it's important in history because this was basically the end of the Indian Wars, which had been going on since Columbus landed here. How much are you looking to get out of it? I wouldn't take less than 60000 Whoa. I just want my buddy to look at it. I just want to make sure this was actually from the Battle of Wounded Knee. You have paperwork here. I just want to make sure everything drives correctly. All right. Okay. Yep. Winchesters were popular with Native Americans for the same reasons they were popular with whites, because they were extremely reliable, extremely powerful, and it was just a really great gun. And most of these guns they were just traded for, correct? Well, there was even a time when the United States military actively sought to arm Native Americans, and they would obviously do so with tribes that were on good terms with the government, and also some of them were obviously taken in battle. So they, Native Americans had guns for a long time, and the Wounded Knee Massacre was really kind of the last great event of the 19th century's Indian Wars, a really terrible moment in the history of the American West. The massacre at Wounded Knee Unfortunately, it was a time when attitudes toward Native Americans were still quite negative. But this was a moment when things started to shift somewhat more sympathetically towards Native Americans. If we can tie it directly to the Wounded Knee Massacre, the 7th Cavalry, the significance of the gun increases dramatically. It's much more than your standard 73 carbine. Well, let's take a look and see what we got here. So what we have here is the unserverable ordnance stores. Basically, it's a 19th century Excel worksheet. I mean, it's a sheet that's telling what they have, the serial numbers, the condition, and what they were going to do with it. Colonel James Forsyth, 
He was the commander of the 7th Cavalry, so that makes sense. Uh, January 3, 1891. Now, what's interesting about that particular day, after the battle took place on December 29th, the weather was terrible. As a result of the snowstorm, it wasn't until several days later that the 7th Cavalry was able to go back to the battle site and actively pick up and collect any weapons that had been discarded. A few of the other names down here, Whitside, he was a major, he was the commander of the first squadron. So most of what we're seeing here matches up. I mean, this is the names we should see, these are the dates that we should see. So on here, it's listing this gun. Can you show me that? Yeah, the 631, I think that's this 631. Let's take a look here. Okay. And then the serial number, it's, you know, it says 50423. We got a Winchester 73 carbine, 50423. All right, so you have some really good paperwork here. So now the one thing we don't have in any of this is wounded knee. Those two words are missing from everything we have on here. But given all of the information that we have, the two individuals, the dates on it, I think we can make the assumption that this gun was taken in the aftermath of the wounded knee massacre. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear. Aren't you gonna put a price on it? Well, I, I work at a museum, I'm not an appraiser, so I'm not gonna put a financial value on here. I was kind of hoping that you'd probably say it was worth a couple hundred thousand, and then I could say, well, give me 60%. <laughs> you know? I'm sure you were. All right, I'm convinced it's from the massacre at Wounded Knee. Let's talk about your price. You want way too much. You just don't get that kind of money for a gun unless there is something very, very special and it's associated with an individual. I'd give you like 14,000 bucks for it. Oh, yeah, no. I mean, yeah. if you put this in auction, you will get right around that number. Really? Mm. I got 12,000 into it. You have 12,000 into the gun. So what's the lowest number you'll go? 50. Obviously, we're not going to do any business. Um, check around. Uh, like I said, I, I really am being completely sincere with you. No, I, I believe you. All right, have a nice day. Thank man. you very much. This guy is off his rocker if he thinks I will pay 50 grand for that gun. Plain and simple. Hopefully, he checks around town, gets a lot of prices, and comes crawling right back to me. We have a World War II German Enigma coding machine. An Enigma. These are amazing. I've seen pictures of them. I've read about them. I've never actually seen one in person. I mean, this thing was responsible for the rise and the fall of the entire German war machine. Where in the world did you get this? My father and I have an Enigma museum, and we treasure hunt. This thing won't make me understand women, will it? That's an Enigma. <laughs> <laughs> During World War II, if a German commander wanted to send a secret message to his troops out in the field, this is what he used. And the Germans thought this machine was completely unbreakable. I'm surprised any of them survived. Not many did. There are three that I know of in the United States on display right now. One is at a, a science museum in Chicago. One is at the NSA's Crypto Museum in Washington. And one is at the International Spy Museum. At the end of the war, they would destroy these in the field rather than let them fall into the hands of the enemy. So more often than not, they are in horrendous condition. Now, this one right here, I mean, you actually found it intact? No, this machine has parts that have been replaced. OK, so these are extra rotors. That's a reproduction box with two rotors. OK. This thing is so incredibly cool. Cracking the Enigma code was one of the top projects of World War II. It took years to do it, but in the end, it did save millions of lives. I really want this thing, but I've never had one in my shop. I need someone to look at it. I'm out of my league here. And how much do you want for it? $149,300. <sighs> That's an odd number. I think it's a fair price. My big problem is... I've seen them sell for $200,000, I've seen them sell for $30,000, and you look at them, they all look the same. So I'm gonna call on a friend who knows a little bit more than I do about these things and see if he can figure it out. All right. Hey, what's, what's up, man? Good to see you. <laughs> what do you uh, got? Uh, a mystery wrapped in a riddle? Yeah, it's an Enigma machine, it's pretty cool. <laughs> 
coolest thing about these things is that they named it the Enigma. Right, right, that is cool. <laughs> if I had a dog, that's what I'd name him. I do have a dog, he's an idiot. <laughs> My name is Will Willis. I'm a former Army Ranger and Air Force pararescue man, and I specialize in military items. The hardest part of being in the military for me was getting a haircut every week. Nothing like having a baby slick head for four years makes you think that uh, hair is kind of nice. It's one of the coolest things that's ever been in the shop. It really is. Yeah, it is. It is a really cool thing, and it's really significant when you talk about being able to encrypt your messages to your generals and your soldiers. You know, having a machine like this that allows you to send those messages in secret is really a critical thing. And it was critical to us, the Allied forces, to be able to decipher these messages. And when we decrypted the machines, it shortened the war by two years. Yeah, this is like uber nerd cool. It really is. Germany's foreign policy was to conquer the world during World War II. So making them believe that their messages were encrypted in secret was critical towards winning that war in a shorter period of time. So which parts were missing when you found it? The warning plate and the rotors. OK. Do we have matching serial numbers throughout? We do not. OK, so how many rotors match the machine itself? None. OK. A serial number wasn't what drove the process. The rotor number was. But the serial number drives price. OK. <laughs> all right. I know the price of these things are all over the place. Right. The most expensive one went for over $200,000. We've got three matched rotors with serial numbers. They don't match the machine itself. The box doesn't have a serial number on it. We've got a recreated box. And considering what things have been selling for that are unrestored with matching serial numbers, I would price this at $70,000 altogether. Well, I think my price is fair. Yeah, because he was asking $149,300. Well, the most expensive one that ever sold was for 200000 That one was in a movie. I think the more fair price is 70000 for everything. Hmm. Well, thanks, man. You got it. I think that sellers get this perception that, like, I put in all this work. It's worth way more than what it really is. I'm going to go with Will on this one. I'd give you 50 grand for it. I can't do that. I mean, what is your lowest number? 115,000. Uh, we're way too far off. We just are. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. All right. This really sucks, because the likelihood of another one coming in my shop is not good. But we are over 60 grand apart, and that's way too much ground to even try and cover. But you know what? I really did want that thing. I have a World War II patch. This is an Alamo Scouts patch. Whoa. Um, where in the world did you get this? So my grandfather was actually an Alamo Scouts, and this has been handed down to me from my father. That is really neat. I know that patch is one of the holy grails of like World War II patches. Oh, yeah. I'm here at Gold and Silver today to sell my grandfather's Alamo Scouts patch. I'd like to sell the patch because I can use the money for a trip to take my children on. I'm looking to get $6,500, but I'll go as low as 5000 This is cool. They were like Navy SEAL, commando, special forces, all wrapped up in one. So this is my grandfather's um, training certificate. He was actually medical aid for the scouts. To whom you may concern, this is to certify that Dominic... Sicipio. Sicipio, mm -hmm. private, 24th Entry Division, has successfully completed the prescribed course of instruction at the Alamo Scouts Training Center from 16 July 44 to 19 January 45. The Alamo Scouts were a very elite unit that um, did long-range reconnaissance. They also were considered bodyguards for General Kruger. I know that you had to volunteer for this. Uh, my understanding was the training was absolutely insane. Yes. You know, they was, it was just massively brutal. Mm -hmm. And then they go like, all right, you six, we're going to throw you on like a Japanese island, and you might be there for a few months, and you're going to have to live off the land. They had to get on these islands, scout them out without getting caught, radio everything back, and survive for just 
unbearable conditions. And um, probably the most impressive thing about these guys is, though, over 100 missions, no one got killed. I don't know if it's the most collectible patch from World War II, but it's one of them. Oh, yeah. And you're looking to sell it? I'm ready to sell it. How much did you want for it? $6,500. <sighs> All right, first off, let me have someone look at this, okay? okay? Um, Sounds good. You know, it's one of those things where a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Sure. This is one of the most sought after World War II patches. And it's also the most faked. Let me get a hold of somebody, get it down here. This guy will know everything about this. Good. Sounds right, good. Give me, give me two or three minutes. We have the Alamo Scouts patch and Very nice. you know, his graduation certificate. Wow. That's interesting. Okay, so now, this was like a secret organization, but not secret? It was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fellow who ran the 6th Army, General Walter Kruger, decided that he needed a long-range group of scouts, and they basically answered directly to him. But it wasn't a, a unit that the Army assigned you to. The patches were designed by the unit, and because these were unofficial, there were only 440 made. And as a member of the unit, you could buy one. That's cool. But here's the big question is, um, is it an original patch? When you called, I looked up Mr. Sicipio, and he was a member of the Alamo Scouts. He wasn't one that, that went in, but he was part of the unit. But he did have to do all the training and everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you mind if I take a close sure, look? Sure, absolutely. Right. The manufacturing looks right to me. You know, the, the, uh, the construction looks right. Because of the paperwork, because of the look, the construction, I'm, I'm going with 80% that this is, in fact, an original Alamo Scouts patch. OK, thanks, man. If it's 80% from you, it's 99% from everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good to meet Thank you. you. Thank you. Too. All right. If Rick is able to get this, this is not going to stay in the shop long. This is one of those patches that any World War II collection has to have. This is rare. So, what's your best price on this? 6000 OK. I'm thinking more like $2,500. Um, you know, when I called him, I checked online. Uh, last one I saw sold, sold for 4200 bucks. It's not going to sell overnight. And I have to make some money on this, otherwise I'm not going to be in business long. Your best price is? 5000 I, You know what? I'll tell you what. I'll give you $3,000 for it. I can't. I can't at that price. <sighs> OK, 32 4800 <sighs> If you change your mind, give me a call. All right, thank you. All right, have a nice Thank day. Thank you. I have a rare Civil War era photograph of a property at Gettysburg on Emmitsburg Road. OK. Um, I believe it to be the Wentz House. The Wentz House. Which was in the middle of the Peach Orchard battle. Actually, I know nothing about this house. <laughs> I have a rare Civil War era photograph. I believe it's the Wentz home in Gettysburg National Park. I'm looking to get 15000 for the photograph. If I'm able to sell this today, I'll probably go out and buy some more unique items. And it has a crazy backstory to it. Childhood home of Henry Wentz. He ended up in the Confederate Army, um, came and fought at the Peach Orchard when his father was in that house. OK. There's questions about, is this actually the Wentz house? I'm not exactly sure. It is Gettysburg National Military Park, but it's unsure of what house it is. I mean, it sounds really interesting. Anything to do with Gettysburg is interesting, OK? It's, um, it's literally the battle that completely changed the course of American history. Have you ever seen any other pictures of this, or? Not of this. The Library of Congress does have one picture, supposedly, of the Wentz house. So you'd have to, like, request it. OK. It's in relatively good shape for them being that old, because photographs this at this time period, when they're put on paper like this, the paper and everything else wasn't the top quality meant to last. Sure. So how much you want for it? I'm asking for 15000 OK. Um, anything related to Gettysburg is worth money. If you can prove a gun was there, it's worth money. I mean, a Civil War uniform, if you can prove, you know, there was a soldier actually wearing it at Gettysburg, it automatically bumps up the value. Anything about Gettysburg, there's value there. 
So let me call someone up to see if this is a house that was there during the Civil War battle, and if it's rare and everything like that. I know one guy who will know everything about it. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. And then if it checks out, I'll figure out what it's worth. Okay. So give me five minutes. I'm going to give him a call. Okay. All right. I'll All be right. right back. Okay. Thanks. So this is the photograph. He says is of the Wentz house, yeah. and Impossible. I know next to nothing about it. So the Civil War was interesting because that was the first war that we photographed. In this case, you're talking Gettysburg. You're talking the the uh, battle that changed the war. And when you talk about the Wentz House, during the battle, the 17th Mississippi went through Sherfy's Peach Orchard, which was right across the street from the Wentz House. So John Wentz, he's in his house as this battle is churning around. He knows all this stuff because he was there. No, <laughs> <laughs> I only look like it. The Wentz House is, is an interesting one. There's no known photograph of the Wentz House that existed during the battle. There is, however, a drawing, and I was able to track that down. In order for something to be correct, everything has to match. So this is not the Wentz House. The Wentz House was actually only a story and a half tall log structure. In looking at this, it's wood frame and it's a wood house. Right. It doesn't quite fit. It had nothing to do with the battle. It's not the the house that people would be uh, particularly interested in. So this is not the Wentz house. This is not, you no. can't confirm it's any Gettysburg. Yeah, it could be another structure that was at Gettysburg. That I can tell you. But it's not the Wentz house. Thanks, man. Not a problem. Very good to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice meeting you. Anytime you have a significant portion of one of the pivotal battles of the Civil War, somebody can find a photograph of that. Any collector would love to have it. This photo is a probably late 1860s farmhouse. Whether it was at Gettysburg or not, that I can't say, but it is not the Wentz house from the Battle of Gettysburg. At this point, um... I don't know what it is. All I know is it's a period photograph. It'd be really hard for me to even retail this at any price. So sure. it's mm -hmm. just not for me. Have a good one, man. All right. Well, thanks for looking at it. No problem. Oh, so Mark might be a little bit smarter than me. A little bit. This is our 1942 North American AT6 Texan. I bet I could do a pretty good job of crashing this thing. <laughs> The guys came down from the pawn shop to look at my AT6 Texan. The reason I want to sell this airplane is my wife and I would like to build a house. I'm asking $185,000. It's absolutely worth every penny of it. So it's uh, a 1942. It's a very famous airplane. In World War II, this was the airplane the government used to train all our pilots. The Tuskegee Airmen all flew this airplane down in Alabama. It has a newly overhauled engine. So how fast is it? Well, this airplane will cruise at 200 miles an hour. It's pretty badass. So how much do you want for it, my man? $185,000. We're actually interested in buying it, so I asked my buddy Matt to come on down, check it out. Dennis, nice to meet you. Before we made an offer. Well, the Texan's an awesome plane. This aircraft was great for training not only our fighter pilots, but also our bomber pilots, the B-17, the B-24 pilots. During World War II, we dominated the skies. This aircraft helped train those pilots to get to that final step. So after this, it's ready for combat. Uh, it's got a clean cockpit set up. This aircraft is fairly basic to fly. Literally, it's up, down, left, right to maneuver the aircraft. You've got a pretty easy throttle. So the last thing to do here is to take this airplane flying. Dennis and I should go airborne. Yeah, let's take her up. All right, let's do it. I've inspected the exterior and the interior of the plane. I'm really excited to fly the aircraft. I wonder what it's like to just hop in any plane you see and be able to fly it. I don't know, but I think it would be pretty cool. OK, you ready to go? Okay. Here we go, man. I thought the aircraft performed very well on takeoff. We did a bunch of aerobatics. We did a couple loops, barrel rolls. Oh, my god. Apparently, it works. So how was it? Awesome. <laughs> it's actually a lot better than I thought it was going to be. 
All right, so what do you think it's worth? Uh, right now, current market, what we're looking at is about 170000 on the spot. All right, well, thanks, Matt. Okay, you bet. Great to see you. Thanks a lot, Matt. Nice job, Des. So what is your bottom dollar? I'd look at something around 165000 Oh. You know, we sort of came out here on a whim. Uh, so on a whim, I'll give you 140 grand. Yeah. I mean, if I buy it off, it's going to sit around for a while. It's going to cost me money to own it until I resell it or figure out what the hell I'm going to do with it. It's a vintage and a classic airplane. There's so much heritage with this. You know what, a 157 kind of warm it up a little bit for you? No. I mean, I'd go like 140 on it if you, if you take it. You know, if you come up just a little bit, at 145, we'd be shaking hands. I'll tell you what, my man. I'm going to go back and do a little bit more research. If I think we can pay 145 for it, I'll give you a call and we'll do it. But uh, right now, I'm going to hold you at 140. Boy, we were really close, so maybe there'll be a phone ringing between here and Vegas. Have a good one, man. All right, thanks a lot, guys, for coming out. I'm bummed we got that close and couldn't make a deal. But I'm glad it was me and Corey that got to check out the plane. 